Heide Marie Jeline Zando was born in 1943 in the small German town of Wessel Buren. As I'm sure you can deduce, she would simply go by the name Jill, and while many people use the Americanized pronunciation of her last name, Sander, the German pronunciation is, as I said, technically Zanda. When she was old enough, she enrolled in Germany's Krefeld School of Textiles, and as a part of her studies, she joined a foreign exchange program that led her to spend two years at UCLA. I'm sure you can imagine that sunny Los Angeles was a far cry from Wesselbjörn, Germany, and she loved every minute of it. The beaches, the winding highways, the Hollywood glamour, this whole experience redefined her understanding of what it meant to be free and youthful, which is something we'd see factor into her design aesthetic later down the road. But at the time, she actually had no intention of becoming a designer. Yes, she had joined the Krefeld School of Textiles to learn more about fashion, but she had her mind set on becoming a magazine editor, and that's exactly what she did. She started out working for a German magazine called Petra. In this role, one of her responsibilities was to organize photo shoots, and she quickly found that the model's outfits rarely aligned with what she wanted. Not thinking much of it, she began reaching out to some of the brands that had produced these pieces and asked them to make alterations. One of these photo shoots was for a German chemical company called Hoaxt, which was using the magazine to promote a newly developed synthetic fiber called Travira. To generate sales, it was important for Hoaxt to demonstrate that fashion brands could use Travira in their collections. But as a chemical company, they had a limited understanding of fashion. So, as she had done many times before, Jill made a few suggestions, and Hoaxt was so impressed with her artistic vision that they invited her to design a full collection on their behalf. To Jill, this came as a bit of a surprise. She had been solely focused on her job as an editor, and had never really thought about becoming a designer. But at the end of the day, making these alterations was her favorite part of the job, so she decided to give it a try. And as it turns out, she loved it. While it wasn't much, designing this collection gave her enough money to quit her job as an editor and to open up her own boutique in Hamburg, Germany. In the beginning, it was a very small operation. She would sell collections designed by other up-and-coming European designers, as well as a few of her own designs made with her mother's sewing machine. That was in 1968 when she was just 24 years old, and it wouldn't be until 1973 that she released her first full collection. That might sound like a long time to wait, but at the start, she knew that she was young and needed to get some experience under her belt. It would have been easy for her to whip up some trendy collection, and who knows, maybe it would have sold well. But she didn't want to do that. She wanted to make collections that were timeless, and doing that takes time. So, like I said, she waited until 1973 to make her formal debut, and the collection featured an array of traditional yet luxurious pantsuits and shirts that were becoming of the modern businesswoman. In this collection, she also established a neutral color palette and precise approach to tailoring that would define her work in the years to come. Some would call it minimalist, and in a sense it was, but in reality, she was just placing form over flashiness. She didn't need to grab people's attention with flashy colors and bold patterns, she could do it with her silhouettes. And that is what I call timeless. Now, the tricky part about creating something timeless is that you want people to appreciate it 10, 50, or even 100 years from now. But at first, they may not appreciate it at all. You see, in the early years of her brand, Jill's so-called minimalism was divisive among the members of her European audience, many of whom clung fiercely to their love of pomp and frills. For that reason, the presentation of her 1975 collection in Paris notoriously backfired. The French demographic simply didn't understand what she was trying to accomplish, and some critics even began referring to her aesthetic as onion-like, in reference to her use of layers. As we know now, she was just ahead of her time, but in the moment, I have to imagine that this was discouraging. She had never intended to become a fashion designer, but on a whim, she decided to go all in. And now, there she was with critics telling her that she had it all wrong. That said, she had just as many, if not more, supporters, and thankfully for us, those are the ones that she decided to listen to. Bouncing back from her flop in Paris, Jill continued refining her design aesthetic, and before long, her collections were outselling the other brands in her boutique. And from there, she continued to grow. Heading into the 1980s, she began showing her collections in Milan, and the audience there simply couldn't get enough. But let me be clear, her influence was quickly becoming global. As I mentioned before, her pieces were perfectly suited for the modern businesswoman, and the timing couldn't have been better, because at the time, the concept of the modern businesswoman was still taking shape. You see, the women's liberation movement was a socio-political movement started in the 1960s that sought to challenge the antiquated perception of a woman's role in society. 
As a result, more and more women were entering the workforce, taking corporate jobs, and even making their way into the C-suite. That said, they had to dress the part, and Jill Sander was the perfect option. It was professional, but at the same time stylish and modern, and for many, that was an incredibly empowering combination. Building off the success of her clothing line, Jill decided to expand by launching cosmetic and fragrance lines as well. The importance of this expansion cannot be understated, because you may have heard me discuss in prior videos that the profit margins on cosmetic and fragrance products can be astronomically high if marketed correctly. So in other words, this was good for the balance sheet, which allowed Jill Sander to expand even more. What also helped with the label's expansion was Jill's decision to list it on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange in the late 1980s. Just some background in case you aren't familiar with how this works, listing a company on a stock exchange opens the door for outside investment, meaning that an average citizen was now able to buy shares in Jill Sander, the same way that you and I can buy shares in Google or Apple. Why would Jill want to do this? Well, like I said, it opens the door for outside investment, which is just a fancy way of saying that you're sourcing money from the public to fund new collections, hire employees, open stores, and whatever else is going to grow your business. Could she have done all of this without listing her label on the Frankfurt Stock Exchange? Sure, but it probably would have taken her a lot longer to get where she wanted to go. Either way, she had made up her mind, and with this new source of funds, she took Jill Sander to the next level. The label had already been making its way into boutiques across the world, but now she wanted flagship stores, including ones in the US, as well as one in Paris, the same city that had turned its back on her years before. By 1995, Jill Sander was bringing in roughly $8 million in profit each year. These numbers were bolstered by the brand's breakthrough into the Asian market, as well as the introduction of a menswear line in 1997. All in all, Jill Sander really hit its stride in the 90s, and with that being said, it wasn't long before the industry giants came knocking. In 1999, the Prada Group acquired a majority stake in Jill Sander for somewhere north of $100 million. I don't need to be the one to tell you that Prada is an absolute juggernaut in the fashion industry, and that's why people were so excited by the news. Jill Sander now had access to all of Prada's resources, so what could go wrong? Well, apparently a lot could go wrong, and it did. Just six months after this announcement, Jill abruptly resigned from her namesake label. While the reasons were mostly kept private, it's widely believed that she began butting heads with Prada CEO Patrizio Bertelli on day one. Over what exactly? I couldn't tell you. But broadly speaking, I would have to guess that they disagreed over the direction in which they wanted to take the brand. One of the main reasons that Jill agreed to Prada's takeover in the first place was because she believed that they had the infrastructure to help her expand the brand's line of accessories. Maybe it had something to do with that, but again, I don't know. All I do know is that Jill decided to leave, and the vast majority of her employees decided to join her. As a result, sales started to tank. And over the next two years, Jill Sander was actually losing money. For Prada, who had just paid more than $100 million for the brand, this was turning into a major disaster. They brought in the Serbian designer Milan Vukramovic to take Jill's place as creative director, but he failed to turn things around. And at the end of the day, there's a lesson to be learned here. A brand is not just a name and a logo. There are real people behind the designs, and if you force those people out, all you have left is a shell of a brand. That's what happened to Jill Sander, and that's why, just two years after the fallout, Patrizio Bertelli reached out to negotiate Jill's return. To the surprise of just about everyone, perhaps even Jill herself, she agreed to return on a six-year contract in exchange for an undisclosed stake in the brand, as well as a more active role in driving the Prada Group's overall strategy. Having agreed on these terms, it seemed as if any hard feelings between Jill and Prada were now water under the bridge. But as we would soon learn... That was not the case. Just 18 months into her newly signed six-year contract, Jill left the label once again. In their press release, Prada called the split amicable, but deep down, everyone knew the truth. The differences between Jill and the Prada group could not and would not be reconciled, no matter how hard they tried. So with Jill gone once again, Prada found itself in a very difficult position. Like I said before, they now had a shell of a brand, and they desperately needed someone to come in and revitalize it. With that in mind, they turned to a young Belgian fashion designer named Raph Simmons, who had burst onto the scene in the early 2000s with collections like Riot 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 and Virginia Creeper. On account of his recent success, Raph was an obvious choice to replace Joe Sander, but given the success of his own eponymous label, the better question was, why would he want to? 
Well, I guess that's a question that only he knows the answer to. But if I had to guess, I'd say this. Jill Sander may have been going through a rough patch, but thanks to its success during the 90s, it was still one of the biggest names in fashion. Raph, on the other hand, had already made a name for himself, but was now looking for an opportunity to take that next step. And joining a name brand label backed by the Prada Group seemed like a good one. Better yet, this would give him a chance to direct both menswear and womenswear. Up until this point, he had only ever designed menswear collections, but had always remained vocal about his desire to someday design womenswear collections. Well, at Jill Sander, he would have all of the budget and infrastructure to do just that, so I have to imagine that that factored into his decision quite heavily. Whatever the case may be, Raph accepted the Prada Group's offer in 2005, and not long after that, made his debut with the presentation of Jill Sander's Fall 2006 menswear collection. While he did embrace the brand's history of chic minimalism, there was no denying that this marked a new chapter in the brand's history, one that would distinctively look and feel like Raph Simmons. He then presented his first women's wear looks in the Fall 2006 Ready to Wear collection, and I think that this is what earned him the trust and admiration of Jill Sanders' fans. Over the course of the next few seasons, he continued earning their trust and admiration with stellar collections. To many, Raph even became synonymous with Jill Sander, which is saying a whole lot. But then, it all went south. In 2012, with seemingly no warning at all, Raph Simmons was fired from Jill Sander. Now I understand that I skipped ahead a bit here, so allow me to take a step back as we try to deduce what happened. In 2006, just one year after Raph joined Jill Sander, the Prada Group sold their stake in the brand to Change Capital Partners, a private equity firm based in London. Right off the bat, that should raise some red flags, because private equity firms tend to squeeze value out of their portfolio companies in any and every way possible. In other words, they're solely looking at this as an investment. Short term, long term, that's really up to them, and in this case, it was a short term investment. Because in 2008, Change Capital Partners turned around and sold the brand to the Japanese fashion conglomerate Onward Holdings. Fast forward a few years, and rumors start circulating that Raph was throwing his hat in the ring for jobs at Dior and Yves Saint Laurent. Whether he was having problems with the management team at Onward, or simply wanted to move to another fashion house, I'm not sure. But hold on, because that's just the tip of the iceberg. On top of these rumors about Raph wanting out, there were rumors that Jill Sander wanted to come back. So if that was the case, what was the problem? Couldn't this have worked out for the both of them? Well, I guess it could have, and in the end it did, but as Bridget Foley from Women's Wear Daily put it, Raph's dismissal was decidedly unceremonious. He had spent the past seven years giving everything he had to reinvent Jill Sander, and rather than letting him leave on his own terms, they essentially slammed the door in his face. Yeah, the corporate side of fashion is known for being cold and heartless, but as a fan of Raph and Jill Sander, this was hard to watch, and it clearly had an effect on Raph. During his final show for the brand, he famously cried while waving goodbye to rows of fans who were just as heartbroken as he was. If you're interested in what Raph went on to do after leaving Jill Sander, be sure to check out my full video about his story. But for now, let's go back to the important point that we glossed over earlier, which is that Jill Sander wanted to return to Jill Sander. Again, the obvious question here would be why, but to be honest with you, I think that the answer is obvious. First off, Jill never wanted to leave her namesake label. As you'll recall, she only left because of her disagreements with the Prada Group. But by 2012, ownership had been passed on to Onward Holdings, and Patrizio Bertelli was long gone. To add to that, we know that she had been itching to get back into fashion, because in 2009, she launched her own fashion consulting firm. The point of the firm was to help other brands execute their strategies, and to design collections that would best resonate with their target audience. Her most notable client was Uniqlo. In October of 2009, Jill partnered with Uniqlo to launch a line called J+, which set out to blend Uniqlo's consumer-friendly approach with Jill's affinity for high-end minimalism. J+, ended up being a major hit, and Jill continues to partner with Uniqlo on a regular basis to this very day. But the main takeaway here is that after nearly 8 years out of the spotlight, there was still an intense demand for her designs. Better yet, Jill Sander the label was in a really good spot thanks to Raph, so now just seemed like the perfect time. That said, she made it official. Jill Sander officially rejoined her namesake label in February of 2012. While fans were sad to see Raph go, they were happy to see Jill return. But unfortunately, this happiness would be short-lived. In October of 2013, 
Jill Sander left her label for a third and final time, attributing the decision to personal reasons. And look, I understand that the label is hers and shares her name, but after joining and leaving three times, you just have to figure that some things aren't meant to be. It's honestly quite sad, and to me, this is one of fashion's biggest what-ifs. What if she had never sold the brand to the Prada Group, and what if she had never stepped down as creative director? Don't get me wrong, I'm glad we got to see Jill Sanders' Raph Simmons era, but you have to wonder where the brand would be today if she had never left. Now, as far as I know, she has no intention of returning to the world of high fashion. I mean, after all, she is 79, but I think it has less to do with her age than it does with the fact that she feels accomplished in her career. In the beginning, she never intended to become a big-name fashion designer. She just wanted to be a magazine editor. But in a twist of fate, she discovered her knack for it, and essentially on a whim, spent nearly all of her savings to open up a boutique in Germany. From there, she started making her own designs, and despite setbacks like her disappointing show in Paris, she persevered. Slowly but surely, fashion fans around the world started to take notice, and from there, the rest is history. Upon her departure in 2014, Jill was replaced by former Prada designer Rodolfo Paglialunga. What I would say about Rodolfo's tenure as director is that he kept the ship afloat, but failed to achieve the critical acclaim that Jill and Raph had achieved. And to be fair, no one was really expecting him to. He remained at the label until 2017, when he was replaced by the husband and wife duo Luke and Lucy Meyer. Let me start by saying that the Luke and Lucy Meyer duo is one of my favorite forces in fashion right now, and they have an incredibly interesting story. In the beginning, they were worlds apart. Lucy came from a small town in Switzerland, and Luke came from Vancouver, Canada. They met at the legendary design school Polymoda in Florence, Italy, where Lucy was studying fashion marketing, and Luke was visiting through an exchange program at FIT. The two of them clicked immediately and never looked back. That was at the start of their respective journeys into the fashion industry, and each one would go in amazing directions. Sometime around 2006, Luke became the creative director of Supreme after a chance encounter with the brand's founder, James Jebbia. He would remain there for eight years and played a key role in Supreme's explosion in popularity, which was unlike anything that streetwear had ever seen before. After leaving Supreme in 2014, he launched his own label called OAMC, which stands for Overall Master Claw. Lucy, on the other hand, began lending her talents to some of the biggest names in fashion, including Louis Vuitton, Balenciaga, and Dior. So clearly, the two of them are stars in their own right, but after their marriage in 2007, they had always wondered what it might be like to work together. And a decade later, they got their chance, as they became one of the first and only husband and wife duos to lead a fashion house together. For most couples, working together might be a challenge, but for Luke and Lucy, it felt natural, because they had been bouncing ideas off of one another since design school, and this was just an opportunity to do that full time. And hey, the results speak for themselves. Since taking over in 2017, the pair have breathed new life into Jill Sander. Generally speaking, I just agree with their outlook. In an interview with Essence, Luke reflected on the brand's reputation, saying, There's a cliché tied to minimalism that is cold, grey, kind of boring, and too non-human too industrialized. I think that at the core of the Jill Sander brand, there's this element of emotion of being very simple and stripped down to the bare essentials. That's what is really the essence of the brand. Now, I really like that because towards the beginning, we talked a bit about how Jill Sander has become a staple in the wardrobes of modern businesswomen, but the intent was never to create some heartless corporate attire. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The intent has always been to take that heartless corporate attire and find beauty in it. So far, Luke and Lucy have done a fantastic job of carrying out that mission, and in a sense, you could say that it's led to a real turnaround at Jill Sander. This is in large part thanks to new management as well, because in March of 2021, Renzo Rosso's OTB group acquired Jill Sander from Onward Holdings. In case you aren't familiar, the OTB group is the holding company behind several big name brands, including Margiela, Marnie, and Amiri, just to name a few. So between Luke and Lucy, as well as the OTB group, Jill Sander is clearly in good hands as it begins this new chapter in its history. Anyways, that's all for this video. Hopefully you learned something new and can see why I believe that Jill Sander has one of the most interesting, dare I say tumultuous stories of all the brands that I've covered so far. If you did like the video, be sure to subscribe, check me out on Instagram at Threducation, and of course check out the Patreon for exclusive content. 
Other than that, thank you all for watching Threducation, and I will see you next time.